you want to go back and, and listen to everything that we said, you can do that. All right. Again, preparing for a successful grazing season. Um, and in thinking about this, you know, we're coming up, spring's a little over a month away. Um, it was less or more than that when I was, you know, kind of thinking about this presentation. But there's a lot of obviously downtime, you still got chores and such, but time more to think um, during the non grazing season about how you want to improve your system for the next year. So, figured let's talk through some tools um, that are available to you to do that uh, while it is still cold and wet outside. Uh, I broke it up into five things and let's just go ahead and take a look at those. So the first one is taking stock, inventorying, evaluating what you have right now. Talking about the condition of your pastures, the condition of your infrastructure, um, evaluating animal demand, and then how all those pieces kind of fit together. Uh, using that information then to develop or maybe refine your plan, maybe you already have uh, a decent plan, but you're just looking to to tweak things here and there. Um, but basically, what are you gonna do and how are you gonna know that it works? Um, and then once you have a plan about how you're gonna treat uh, animal demand and pasture production, how do you make sure you have the right nutrients, the right time, in the right place, and the right amount available to grow the forage that you're hoping and expecting? And then we'll finish off with two kind of smaller topics, more maybe in the tips and tricks section of things. Uh, which I've titled Mo to Grow, just working with grass, working and understanding grass physiology to keep uh, palatable grass for as long as you can. And similarly, staving off that cliff of production in the summer to get as much production as you can for as long as you can. So without further ado, uh, oh, I guess with a little bit more to do, <laughs> this won't work too well with the folks on the call, but for, at least for the folks in the room here, I'm curious on this scale, you know, with one hand up in the air, um, knowledge level as it pertains to grazing management, where, where would you place yourself in, in a continuum like this? Very little knowledge, just starting out, just haven't had livestock before, interested in um, getting some and trying grazing management or been doing it for years? In the middle. Everybody's in the middle. One, okay. Got some ones. That's yeah, good. Gwen, did you have something? Okay, we'll go ahead. That helps so that I know where to be more specific and less specific on, <laughs> on things as we're going through. So, okay, so the taking stock piece. Um, this, we're, we're gonna talk about the components of your, your grazing system. But first you gotta know what it is that you want to do, right? Uh, contextualize what you have in so far as where you wanna be in the next year, three years, five years. So just really wanted to put a simple plug in there to, to say, you know, the, the key to a good grazing plan is setting good goals for what you want to achieve. And in our organization, a lot of other organizations use a really common um, kind of framework for that called SMART goals. I'm sure folks have heard of it before. Um, the, the actual acronym seems to change a little bit each time I find a, a, a different <laughs> uh, infographic, but the one I, I found uh, puts it as specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. The, the big three, I think, are the specific, measurable, and timely. Namely, what in particular are you going to do? Not, I want to have better grazing management. Pick something that, one component of that specifically that you want to work on. How are you going to measure whether you've done it or not? That could be numbers. That could be a yes or no question. Um, and then what time frame are we talking about? Is this in the next 50 years? Because that's going <laughs> to change how you go about planning for it, um, as opposed to if you're you're planning to do it in the next three. So just put some examples there below it, so folks have an idea of what that looks like. Um, so the first one there being reduce hay bill uh, by uh, five percent by improving pasture production over the next three years. So is that specific? It's pretty specific. We're talking about one thing. We're talking about our hay bill. Um, is it measurable? 
yeah, you know how much you're spending on A and you've, you've set a percentage target of that that you want to meet, or you could just say, I want to reduce my hay bill. Um, and then by improving pasture production over the next three years, that's timely. Is it achievable and realistic? That's going to depend on, on your circumstances, but um, that would be an example of a SMART goal. Uh, provide enough forage of adequate quality for 20 cow calf pairs from April to December, basically, is another example. This time we're talking about specific quantity of animals for a specific period of time. Um, that gives you a, a good sense of what you'll have to do to plan around that. And then once you've gotten to that level, this picture is kind of small, but if it's the way your brain works, you can start to write that down, whether it's in a table, a journal, what have you, and um, kind of parcel out the, the costs that are gonna be associated with that. Are you gonna need more fence cross fencing? Are you gonna need more watering infrastructure? Uh, are you gonna need to address nutrient management, all these individual pieces? Um, and there's a great document. We'll talk a little bit more about the resource. It's back over there, Pasture and Grazing Management in the Northwest. It's a huge resource. Um, wouldn't necessarily recommend you just go ahead and sit down and <laughs> read through the whole thing each night, but uh, it's broken up really nicely into sections. So the first section, it deals with planning. Um, they have a specific section on um, incorporating that plan into your business model. Um, I think the uh, section of that that's printed out over there is grazing cell or paddock design. So a lot of really cool resources that are pretty accessible in short chunks. I think the um, grazing cell design is 10 pages, something like that. So a pretty easy read. The publication is Pasture and Grazing Management in the Northwest. It's, uh, yeah, of sorts. It's a publication out of um, University of Idaho, uh, Univer uh, Washington State University, and the University of Oregon, or Oregon State University, sorry. So, comments? yes. Um, I have a couple, or just one comment that came um, remotely. Do you want me to? Yeah. Right now? Yeah, go for it. Okay. This one person who said there's been, and this, this goes back to the knowledge level that they've been farming for 30 years, but five years into pigs and needing some other suggestions. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that a little louder? Yeah. Um, the, this person has been farming for 30 years, but only five years into pigs and needs some other suggestions. Can you hear that? I could hear that. Yeah. Um, as far as managing pigs on pasture. I would, I would encourage that um, person to go ahead and put their contact information. Unfortunately, pigs aren't going to be a, a big focus of the presentation. It's broad enough that there should be good principles to take away, but um, I'd be happy to follow up with them. Okay. Um, another question is if you're going to be uh, repeating the question, or sorry, not repeating this, if you're going to be sending out or making available some of these. Um, <laughs> yes, about. yes, that's a great point. Yes, I, I've got a table of resources here, and I typically follow up with an email with all those resources and maybe a few more to folks afterwards, um, just in case they forgot to grab something or uh, anything of that sort. So yes, I'll send out an email to folks on the webinar as well. Anything else? Nope. Okay. So the first piece of that is, um, or once you have your goals kind of set, um, the first piece to address is what is the condition of your pasture right now? You can see kind of two examples of that, not to pick on horse people here, um, but two examples of uh, a relatively well-managed system and a system that could probably do with a little bit of improvement. Um, mm -hmm. And, and not only what condition is your pasture in right now, but think back to what condition it was in last fall. Fall grazing management has a huge impact on the uh, production of the next season and beyond. And that's because September, you know, end of, end of August to beginning of October really is the start of the, of the forage growing season. And so when the rains return, they're setting new roots 
and um, setting some new growth that's going to form the foundation of the next spring's growth. So if you're putting it into deficit before uh, it goes into winter and comes out next spring, you're going to really decrease your production. So some questions to ask yourself when you're evaluating your grass season. How is the growing season and forage production? Just how, how did you feel about it? You can quantify that if you've been doing it long enough, but I think qualitative is probably even just as useful. Did you feel good about it? Did it, did you wish there, you, I guess you always wish there was more grass, but um, were, were there things that you could have done to, to achieve that? How did uh, this year's production compare with the last three years to kind of establish, are we moving in the right direction, the wrong direction? Um, does the grazing intensity for each pasture appear to be you know, more or less correct for what we're trying to do. If it's uh, just an exercise area, that could be completely different than if you're trying to do a managed intensive grazing system. It's one of the reasons I'm not going to get overly specific. It's because all of you are going to have um, kind of your own situations on that. But the key is knowing what it is that you're trying to do and what you're expecting the, the grass to, the, to do for you in that system. And then uh, the last one there is based on the past year's grazing, which pasture, if any, need lighter grazing. That's pretty key. Um, where should we maybe decrease our uh, intensity of grazing? That could also go the other way around too, though. Um, if there is forage that you've left on the table and you've had to get out there and mow it, or you've lost it because it, it's overmatured, that could be um, a sign that you at least for that period have some extra capacity um, to bring on. So pay attention to both of those things. And then the little note there on the bottom is just um, about a tool. It's on the uh, table back there. It looks like this. And it's a tool that we use in our planning process. It's the pasture production estimate guide sheet. And it takes a little bit of know-how to know, to, to use, but um, the thing I like about it is that you go through the questions on here, and even if you're not 100% right on each of them, it gives you kind of a rough percentage of your potential that you're, you're currently at. Um, and that gives you a point in time that you can come back and, and reference later on. Um, and it will also kind of identify those areas. It's broken up into what the stubble light is, what your fertility is, um, what your grazing system's like, how long are they on there, all of those pieces. And depending on how those score, you can see, oh, I guess I'm really limiting myself because, um, you know, I, my grazing system is, is over 14 days and I'm just eating the regrowth as it's coming on and the grass is never getting a chance to uh, to reestablish. So that may be way farther than you want to go, but <laughs> the resource is there, or you can reach out to us and we're happy to come out and, and walk through that tool with you. So not going to spend a lot of time on infrastructure just because it's going to be very different, different for everybody. Um, but just simple things to consider and you'll know your system best. Um, but just considering are there repair needs that I have around fencing or watering, gutters and downspouts, those kind of pieces. Like I mentioned before, depending on what you're trying to do, trying to break up your pastures into uh, more defined grazing units, are you gonna need more fence? How much is that gonna cost? All of these pieces. So the part that we're gonna spend a little bit more time on, I love this picture, <laughs> is uh, evaluating, an evaluating animal demand. How many folks have done this before? Anybody? You? Okay. Cool. That's great. Well, it's a good reminder for those folks who have done it. Um, and for folks who haven't and who are just starting out, this is kind of a keystone piece for figuring out how much, how many livestock you can have. Um, so animal demand starts with, um, yeah, how much feed does my herd need? And I feel like I should have a a scary noise sound effect here because this is going to require a little bit of math, but it's, <laughs> it's not too bad. Um, the, the, how much feed your herd need is a function of the number of livestock you have, their average weight, 
and uh, the amount of feed in dry matter that they eat per day. That's basically expressed as a function, usually between one and 5%. So they're eating 1% of their body weight per day in, um, in feed, whatever that happens to be. Um, once you have that number figured out for your herd, you can then figure out how much ground that's gonna take. And so you use that daily herd um, intake number that you've come up with. It's gonna be modified by your grazing efficiency. That's kind of a stock number. Same with the dry matter intake. This isn't something that you necessarily just have to know off the top of your head. You can find these numbers or talk to us and we can help you find those numbers pretty easily. Um, and then uh, divided by the pounds of dry matter per acre you have out in the field. And that gives you how much, how many acres you need daily for that particular herd. I will say that this works well for all livestock, except for really poultry and swine, unfortunately, <laughs> just because they don't utilize the pasture in the same way that more traditionally grazing animals do. Um, they'll eat grass here and there, but they're really, you know, digging around in the soil and looking for bugs and, and other pieces that aren't, you know, captured by this. So um, we're going to walk through an example of this. Um, and the scenario I picked more or less at random <laughs> was uh, to look at 10 dried dairy cattle, judging by their size, their jerseys. That gets them in about thousand pounds makes it the math pretty easy for this um, but the process for any animal class is going to be the same the other worksheet that's back there on the table and that I will send out to folks on the call is this worksheet and you see it up here on the screen um, it's basically just to help keep you oriented as you walk through all of the equations I also have an Excel version of this if folks are interested in that and it's already got the, the equations, the functions in it. So you can just enter the numbers you need and it will give you the results without the calculator. So, but we're looking at those 10 dry dairy cattle and I've given away the, given away the answer, but let's walk through what it looks like. So that question of how much feed does my herd need starts with what does it start with? Anybody? Yeah, number of, number of livestock, right? Yeah. And then the average size of those livestock and then how much they eat per day as a percentage of their body weight. In this case, it tends to be, or it happens to be 2%. So if we walk through that, very simple math, I looked it up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what a dried dairy, Jersey dairy cow. It'll depend on species and then also conditions. So if it was a lactating Jersey cow, they'd be eating a lot more percentage of the body. Same with a growing animal is going to be eating a lot more percentage of its body weight than one that's just maintenance. That goes for horses too. So if you have a really highly exercised horse, they're going to eat more obviously than one that's not so much. Uh, so the math is 10 times 1,000, 10,000, not very scary. And then times 0 0.02, that's just 2% as a decimal. That gets us to 200 pounds uh, daily dry matter intake for that herd of 10 cows. And did I lose anybody going through that? So how much ground will that take? This is a little bit more in depth, not too bad, but um, the 200 on top of the divisional factor there is uh, the daily herd dry matter intake. The 55%, that's another one of those numbers, that's the grazing efficiency that I told you you could look up. In the, the worksheet that I have and here on the screen, you can see it down. Um, where's my cursor? There we go. You can see the um, kind of the table that this comes out of. And incidentally, this, the, the publication that this worksheet came out of is also there on the table. And I can send out which one it is to folks on the call. So you look at 
I keep losing my cursor. <laughs> you look at this grazing uh, system utilization um, table and it's given you approximate ranges, right? So for a rotation every two to three days, um, we're getting roughly 58%. For a rotation every six to eight days, we're getting roughly 50%. And that has to do with trampling, um, selective grazing, avoiding, well, I guess that goes along with selective grazing, but avoiding fouled forages um, and manure, urine, that kind of stuff. Um, and then particularly as you get longer, the um, grass is starting to regrow. And so they're starting to go back for those um, little, uh, regrowth, sweet and tender regrowth. So um, in this situation, we said 55% were somewhere in the middle there. Um, and then to figure out our pasture production, we use the table right next to it. Um, we've got a mixed pasture. It's in pretty good condition. So we're going to say it provides 300 pounds per inch per acre of forage. So that means each acre that has an inch on it is 300 pounds. Then because of our grazing system, we know we're, we're going to be taking off about four inches. Let's say we're going to start at eight inches and we're going to graze it down four inches. You can multiply those to get 1,200 pounds. So 200 divided by 55% gets you to 363. 300 pounds times four gets you to 1,200. There it's super easy. You just divide it and you come out to about 0.3 acres per day to meet that 200 pounds uh, of daily dry matter intake. Now, did I lose anybody? <laughs> no, okay. So we're gonna come back to those numbers in a minute in kind of the next section of the plan and that's using that information. So the condition of your pastures, which I recommend you be very realistic about um, and know what it is that you're trying to do. Um, by that, I mean, don't expect a pasture that's been grazed down to an inch for several decades to suddenly start producing, you know, three tons of forage for you um, very quickly. Um, so knowing what your pasture condition is, knowing the state of your infrastructure and what you may have to add, and then now knowing what your animals require feed-wise that you can supply during the grazing season. Using that on the, uh, to develop a grazing plan, uh, there's just a few options of uh, what grazing plans could look like. It could be, uh, you know, a, a graphical representation. It could be a grazing chart. Really like grazing charts. There's a good example of it later in here that I will show you. I was trying to find one that I could print off, but I didn't get to it. I'll hopefully send that out later. But like I said, there's lots of resources uh, to help you on, on the journey of developing your plan at whatever scale that you want it to be. It could be bite-sized chunks out of that pasture and grazing management in Northwest Guide, uh, the Western Oregon and Washington Pasture Calendar, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about is another great resource. Tons of extension bulletins out there on uh, various facets of pasture management, whether it's nutrient management, uh, managing hay, renovating, all those pieces, that's where I would recommend you go first, is those land-grant university resource, resources that have been, you know, are based on years of research. Um, ATRA, that's just kind of a specific call out. They're a, a nonprofit uh, that does some nice fact sheets um, on grazing and a bunch of other topics as well. So they might be a place to look. Of course, industry publications on pasture is a pretty great publication. Uh, and then of course, us. Uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is our sister federal agency, um, WSU, or any of the other uh, land-grant universities in the area. So like I said, we're just going to take a small detour, talk about the Western Oregon and Western Washington mm -hmm. pasture calendar, because it's new. I like the way it's broken down. I don't know that it works for everybody, but I want to highlight it in case folks find that it really works for them. So it came out in 2017, uh, Oregon State University, Washington State University, University of Idaho, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, collaborated to put it together. 
And basically what it does is it breaks down each growth period, um, each change in age of growth of your forage grasses into what the grass is doing, what's going on out in the environment, uh, what management you should consider and what management you should avoid. So looks a little bit like that. I know that <laughs> that doesn't look automatically that much <laughs> more helpful, um, but each of the kind of colored squares over here are a grazing period. They'll make a little bit more sense, or a, a, rather a growth period, grass growth period. They'll make a little bit more sense in a second. Um, but as you can see, they roughly correspond to the calendar and they're, they change slightly depending on uh, where you are uh, geographically, which makes sense, right? So it's, it's a nice, more or less geographically specific resource. So you can see, um, just looking at this, you can see some difference here between, uh, this is uh, the foothills. So, you know, up in Buckley, for instance, uh, versus down here, down in the valley, um, the droughty to adequate, that would be the prairie soils more down towards Roy and Yelm and that area. And you can see that they're a little bit different throughout the calendar. Things start a little bit earlier, end a little bit later, those kind of things. So once you start thinking about it that way, I think it, it becomes a little bit more of a useful tool. Um, and just February is a key month. We'll talk about why that is in a second. So we're not going to spend a ton of time on this. I just want to show you what it looks like, um, what each of those uh, colored squares actually represents. And so we go back here, we can see um, the period four goes until, you know, about mid-February. We're just coming out of it. And that's a period of very slow growth. So the grass at this point is pretty dormant, growing slowly, if at all, depending on you know soil moisture and um, temperature and those kind of things. One of the interesting pieces of this time of year, carbohydrate levels are high in the grass, and so if you have if there's a stretch of dry weather and you, you want to get livestock out, it's going to be a lot harder to manage them out there because the grass is sweeter and um, so you may manage the same way, but because of the palatability of the grass, they're responding that much quicker to grazing, number one, because of that and because they've been cooped up for the past six months, right? So that's, I think that's useful information. It's useful knowledge. The environmental factor is pretty straightforward. It's cold, it's wet. Um, management needed, graze only if your soils aren't saturated. Compaction is a, is a really hard, um, issue to overcome and it's best just to not start it if you haven't already. Um, start tracking T-SUM, which we'll talk a little bit about, and then utilize confinement areas as needed. And things to avoid is basically the converse of that. A little bit more information on uh, environmentally, if you're over supplying nitrogen at this time, what could happen? And then down below, you can see the dates roughly of when those happen. So, as you might expect, it starts a little bit earlier in the uh, foothills, it goes a little bit longer. Um, and between the lowlands and the prairie soils, that's, there's not that much different. Uh, we're just coming into period five, which is a period of increasing growth. So um, soil temperatures are warming up, the grass is growing, moisture is there. Um, so it's going to start putting on growth. As it's doing that, it's using those carbohydrate reserves, so it's a little bit less palatable, a little bit easier to manage. Still, we're, it's pretty wet, so it'd be hard to get them out on pasture uh, very consistently. Um, uh, make, you can make your first applications of nutrients here under the management needed section um, around this time. Uh, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's not, oh, February rolled around and we can, <laughs> Robin said we can go out and spread manure. No, um, but if you're monitoring uh, air, average air temperature and cognizant of what the weather is going to do and if you're close to streams and you can graze the, the grass that you're going to grow, you could get a start on the season at this, at this point. So again, looking at when it happens, it's um, a little bit uh, later to start on the foothills, goes a little bit later, 
Uh, and again, not a whole lot of difference between the lowland and prairie soils. Last one here, um, period of rapid growth. So that's the spring flush when grass really, really, really starts to grow. Excuse me. Um, both protein and carbohydrate levels in the forage tend to be lower at this point. Um, and interestingly, you know, you'll hear constantly, we talk about uh, leaving three inches at least of stubble when you're grazing. Uh, they're recommending even higher than that, four to six inches of grazing. Part of that, we'll talk about um, some benefits of doing that later on. Um, one just kind of obvious benefit is it takes, you know, roughly amount, the same amount of time, give or take, for, to grow from three inches to six inches as it does from four inches to eight inches or to, to grow back the half that you may have grazed off. And so if you're starting from a higher grazing point to begin with, a higher stubble height, you're going to get that much more grass. Um, so just something to consider. And then as far as when, when uh, this period happens, if you're interested in reading into more of the detail, there's a few, um, public, a few copies of this over there. And then again, I'll send it out. Um, but uh, starts a little bit later, again, on the foothills, goes a little bit later. Not a whole lot of difference between the lowland and prairie soils. So that's just one example of a resource that you could look into. Doesn't necessarily have to be at that depth, but um, there, the information's out there for, to make informed decisions. So now we're gonna come back to the same example that we were working on before with those 10 dry dairy cattle. Now they look suspiciously like sheep, uh, <laughs> but um, we're gonna, <laughs> what happened? I know. Um, now we're gonna uh, take the average or the uh, acres we needed per day and, and extrapolate that to, okay, how big do my paddocks need to be for how long they're gonna be out there? How many paddocks am I gonna need depend, you know, based on um, my uh, grazing system, how, how many days they're on there and how many days rest we have. And then roughly how many total acres is that? So I don't think I go through, no, I don't. I saved you the, the going through the math this time, but um, uh, you can see the, the equations at least here. So how big do my paddocks need to be? It's pretty simple. It's how big they need to be per day or how, how, much, how many acres you need per day to meet that daily herd intake and then how many days they're gonna be there. So that 0.3 that we came up before, came up with before, um, times five days they're going to be on the pasture comes out to um, 1.5 acres per paddock. So each grazing unit is going to be roughly an acre and a half, give or take. So each of the squares that are up here would ideally be an acre and a half. Some may be a little bit bigger, some may be a little bit smaller. But, um, you want to be close. And then from there we can figure out how many paddocks do we need. And that's a function of uh, the amount of rest we're going to give the pastures, that's going to change throughout the season. Earlier in the season, you're going to need less uh, rest because the grass is going to be growing a lot faster. And then later into the summer, when there's not as much, the soil temps are higher, there's not as much moisture, the grass is going to slow down, you're going to need to get more rest. 30 days is, a, is an average. Um, so then plus the five days that they're going to be on that one paddock to begin with, divided by five days per paddock gets you to seven. So in this scenario, for those 10 uh, dry cattle, dairy cattle, um, we're gonna want seven paddocks of about an acre and a half each to, to approximately meet their needs during the grazing season, season uh, for a total of 10 acres, give or take. And I should say, this is not, you're going to run this tool and then you're going to go through a grazing system. You're going to say, well, that wasn't quite right. And yeah, it wasn't quite right. It'll get you in the ballpark. It'll get you a start. But from there, it's up to you to kind of fine tune what um, the specifics of your soil type and your microclimate and all those little things that will play into it. But so now we have a grazing system that consists of seven paddocks that are an acre and a half. So we researched, we kind of planned out what our system's gonna look like. What do we do after that? 
I would strongly suggest that you write it down. Um, and it could be, again, as in-depth as you want to be or as loosey-goosey as you want to be. Uh, and I've tried to organize the points kind of in increasing management intensity. I think the very least you should do is write down how long they're going to be on the pasture um, and at what frequency. So how long are they going to, yeah, you have a question? Yeah. There's a few ways you can do it. We'll talk about one option. I guess I'll just spoil it now. Mowing is one option. So if you're hey, Robin, can you repeat the question? Oh yes, sorry. And now we got the train going by. So hold on one sec. <laughs> the question was, how do you accommodate the difference in growth periods between early in the season and late in the season when you're planning? an average. So when I put down an average rest of 30 days and then immediately said, well, it's never going to be, <laughs> well, it may be one time in the season exactly 30 days. How do you deal with that? Um, like I said, you could, uh, you can mow it. So as the grass is getting ahead of you and it's going to go to seed, you could get out there and mow it. It's going to grow back. So um, that's one way. You could be flexible enough in your management that you're grazing more intensively during those periods, moving more often, getting greater utilization, those kind of things. Yeah. Robin, would, I have a question from the phone. Yes. Um, can a newly created and planted spring paddock be graze ready by some time in the same year? Can a new, I'll repeat it, can a newly seeded, um, they were seeded in the spring, you said? Yes be ready sometime in the same year? Yeah. I would say probably not. Um, the way to check would be to go out and give it, a, give it the tug test, as they call it, and make sure that when the livestock get out there, they're not gonna pull the newly pl planted grass. It's not established enough yet to really stand up to grazing, much grazing intensity. Um, you know, it depends. If, if you have water or you have, um, well, probably just if you have irrigation, that would be the, the biggest um, mowing. Is that what you're saying, Renee? Renee's sharing her wisdom. Uh, mowing it to, to get it to put more of its energy into root growth can, can also speed that process up, but it's going to be tough within that first year, I think. So. Anything else, Gwen? Not yet. Okay. Next level of... Uh, intensity would be not just going off of kind of static uh, duration and, and rest, but really having triggers for when you're going to do things. And by that, I mean, at what height are you going to move the animals on? Is it going to be six in inches? Is it going to be eight inches? Is it going to be 12 inches? How much will you take slash when will you take them off? So, you know, are you going to take 30%? Are you going to take 50%? Uh, is your stubble height going to be um, it should be over three inches, and you saw from the pasture calendar, it's some, sometimes the year it might even have to be more than that. Um, but you want to kind of give yourself that guideline. And then the other thing, this is just a little uh, tidbit, would be to figure out where that is on your, on your boot, maybe. And so as you're walking through the field, you can see really quickly, am I close to three inches? Uh, am I way lower than, because... You'll always walk through the field if you don't know where to, <laughs> what three inches in. Say, so, yeah, of course that's three inches. That looks good. So, you know, try and give yourself an easy check. And then probably the most important, which is tough sometimes, is when will you choose not to graze? When are you going to say, nope, we're going to move them onto gravel or concrete or whatever you have, sacrifice area, and, and keep them off the field? Next level, which you should probably do at any, regardless of how in-depth you're gonna go, is some level of monitoring. Just how are you gonna check that it's working for you? That could just be a simple gut check. Could be photos or uh, other, other tools. And then you can go down a rabbit hole and plan out everything that you're ever gonna do. <laughs> so, you know, when are you gonna so uh, soil sample? When are you gonna um, apply nutrients? How will you manage your irrigation water if you're lucky enough to have it, et cetera? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
So those are just the individual pieces that you can continually add on as you hone things in. So to get you started on those things, I have just the basics um, for folks who aren't familiar with it. On the grazing duration and frequency, really recommend less than five days per paddock. You can do it. Um, and if you can't, if it's like, oh, but it, that doesn't fit with my, you know, then I got to keep track of it moving week to week. You could leave them out there for five days and then put them in the sacrifice area for two. That's, you know, that may impact your hay bill, but could also keep you here um, within this less than five days. The reason for less than five days is after that, the grass is going to start to regrow. And like I said before, it's like kale versus an ice cream sandwich. You know, it, it, one is very sweet and attractive and the other one is healthy, but not quite as valuable. So uh, don't give uh, your livestock the choice between these two. And then like I say, rest typically 15 to 45 days, give or take, depending on the conditions. Um, 30 days is a good average to plan around. On the grazing trigger side, did you have a question? No, okay. Hey Robin, there yes. is a question from the, and this was actually back, back on your last slide, is okay. do you remove manure from paddocks each time you rotate harrow yeah. or leave it as it falls? Yeah, yeah, good, good question. I mean, it, I guess it would depend on, oh, let me repeat the question back to you. Um, should you remove, I'm going to wait until the train goes by. <laughs> should you remove manure from paddocks after each rotation should you drag harrow those kind of things i'm seeing some no faces in the audience out here <laughs> yeah yeah um it really depends and i hate to say that because it's kind of a cop out but it does depend um if you are intensively stocked or you have just exercise areas again i don't want to single out horse people but if you are keeping horses let's say in an area that you know is not going to provide the feed for them. It's just to get them out, um, out of around the stall um, in the sacrifice area. Picking your manure can be a good thing to do uh, if you can swing it. And that's just because likely you don't have enough product, um, grass growing out there to really take up the nutrients that you're putting down in the manure in the yard. So that would be best case scenario. Uh, should you drag or harrow? That is, yeah, ideally, you know, most folks can benefit from that. A lot of reasons. Breaks up the, the parasite cycle. Of course, if you have long enough rotations, you can take care of it that way too. But um, just another check on that. Distributes nutrients a little bit more evenly so they're not just clumped where they've been deposited. So it can be, yeah, a benefit uh, regardless kind of of your circumstance. But again, it's a question of management. If you're gonna not do anything because you're like, oh my goodness, I have to harrow and I'm not gonna do it, forget about it. You know, try something first and and get it down and then come back to it and, and try and work it in later. Any other questions, Gwen? No. Okay. Raising triggers. I have to do a time check. I think I'm good. Um, Okay, uh, so begin, beginning raising height will depend on your species. Uh, typically between eight to 12 inches is ideal. Uh, it depends on what the livestock, you know, what their grazing preference is, um, how, what your tolerance is for letting it grow, how easily, excuse me, you could mow it, all those pieces, but um, eight to 12, somewhere in that range. Uh, on the question of when will you um, not decide not to graze, I move this up. Um, saturated soil, dormant grass, not enough regrowth in the fields equals no grazing. Don't go out there if you can help it. Um, and that's, that's important. I mean, I know it's um, enticing to, to get livestock on green grass but once you understand that the you gotta you gotta manage your grass as well as you're managing your livestock for you know get, think about it the same way um you really want to set it up for the best production it can give you and and that may require just leaving it alone for a little bit 
<clears throat> All right. And then on how much will you take, kind of the old standard is take half, leave half. That can fluctuate depending on your system. Really, the reason for not raising much more than a half, unless you're going to leave it for a pretty long period of time, is because of some studies done, I think, in the mid-20th century that showed um, response, uh, a root growth response, as in it stopping if you graze much more than half of the plant. It basically goes into shock and, and stops growing. So you want to try and stay um, as close to that half as you can. That gives you a good amount of production. And then at least three inches at all times, at least three inches, three inches. How many inches? Three inches. <laughs> Four to six sometimes, <laughs> yeah, if you listen to the pasture calendar. And then monitoring. Uh, it could be, you know, whatever works for you. Calendar, a notebook, photos uh, from our example the first time around, your hay bill, if that was something you're trying to address. It could be any number of things. Again, there's a grazing chart here on the right-hand side, and we're going to see a better example of that right now. So after you've developed your plan, you have spent a season kind of trying to implement it, and maybe you don't do every single thing that you've written down. Um, but that's okay because it's a process. At the end of the season, you should kind of sit down, reflect, and then plan how you're going to adapt to anything um, that may have cropped up during the season, whether that was just an unrealistic expectation on your part about what you were going to be able to do or not um, accounting for pasture condition or what, whatever it happens to be. Um, but then go through questions that might look familiar how was the growing season in forage production? How did this year's production match the last three years? Um, how does the grazing intensity look to uh, what I'm trying to do? And what do I need to graze less? What do I need to graze more intensively? And I, I, those questions were earlier on, and there's, there's something you could come back to time on uh, year on year and, and assess how you're doing. And then I just, I gave this, uh, grazing chart a lot of screen space because I think it is awesome. <laughs> awesome. Whoever put this together was doing an awesome job. Um, so you can see, I'm trying to get my cursor up here, um, the black squares are basically how long the livestock were on the pasture. You can see they've written in when they clipped or mowed the pasture. You can see uh, they put in dates for how long uh, rest they got off each of each paddock. But even more than that, <laughs> they've put in graduation dates, a 20th wedding anniversary. Um, yeah, just all kinds of, you can tell that this person, this is probably hung up, you know, by the back door where they can just fill it in. It functions as their calendar that they would keep for anything else. I think it's just a really cool example. Not that you have to go to this much depth, but just that it can be something that you kind of embed in your process. So. And then uh, the power of photos, not really going to talk a whole lot about this other than to say, look at some pretty photos. Um, you see some examples of uh, different grazing management techniques. Um, I love the horse one with some, some great grass growth going on. But the other piece of this is just that I, you know, will occasionally meet people through this line of work who say, oh my goodness, you know, I've worked with so-and-so or I just, you know, really started reading and, and improving my pastures and I'm so happy with the way things have turned out. And I'll say, oh, that's awesome. Did you take, did you take any pictures? And they will say no. And I'm just, I'm inspired by what they're doing and I would love to be able to see it. And I think it would be pretty powerful if they were able to see it too, kind of look back and say, wow, you know, I really did come a long way or, oh, you know, some, I see a lot more weeds maybe I wasn't, you know, paying attention to or just whatever it happens to be that you have a reference point, kind of an objective reference point on. So, our photos. All right, on to the third uh, subject. And hey, that, Robin. Yes. Two, two questions, or one question and one comment here. Sure. The comment is, thank you for the grazing chart with the notes. They really like that. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> I thought that was cool. And the question, and this goes back to the paddocks again, is um, do you, can you put chickens in after for spreading manure? Sure, yeah. Can you do leader follower style grazing? Yeah, that can work. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely can work. 
I'd say um, it becomes a little bit more tricky to manage what the chickens do to your stubble height after you've brought the grazing animal through um, and they're adding a, you know, a fair amount of nutrient on. <laughs> Did everybody hear that question? I'm sorry, I didn't repeat that. Okay. And then we've got a, we've got a, a not a rebuttal, but an add on from <laughs> somebody in our audience. Yeah. Yeah. Misha, who's here from Bright Eyed Acres, um, is saying they do pasture poultry. Um, is saying it makes sense to, to wait a few days on the grazing animal after the or the poultry to follow, so you let the parasites start to develop and hatch, so that the chickens can actually do their work as far as eating, digesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely can be done. It's just uh, it's another comp it's another complication to the management, right? It's the next step um, that you have to be ready for. And then you said that you had another question? Nope, that was it. Okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Sure. We are going to get to that. The dragging piece, uh, not so much, but um, dragging ideally would be after every rotation. I think some level of dragging is better than no level of and then mowing, we're going to talk about a little bit more specifically in a second. Anybody else? Moving on. Feed your forages. Um, okay, another little detour. You saw T sum two hundred come up. I know this is a little bit of a busy slide, but it's I I think it's an important um, component to consider, and it's uh, one of those pieces that uh, when you're in late January, early February, and you're dreaming about the spring, you can track to see just when it's coming and not have to listen to a groundhog. Um, so T-SUM 200 is basically, well, first of all, what it is, it's a repeatable method of de determining when forage growth begins increasing. Um, and it is essentially just an accumulation of heat units, is what they call it, or growing degrees is another term that's used in other crops. Really what it is, is average air temperature, um, to make it really simple. And you can see an example of what that looks like. I had started to track it for our February 5th class, and it looked like we were just about there. And then we got, <laughs> got the weather we did. So we're still a little behind the, the threshold for, for T-SUM. Um, but basically, and it's, it's easiest in Celsius, you can do it in Fahrenheit but you take the maximum and the minimum, add them together, divide them by two, and that gives you your, your heat unit for that day. So the first, we had three units, second, we had three, third, we had nine. So in those first three days, we had 15 of our 200 units. And then the idea being, once you've kind of gotten to those 200 units, the soil temperature is warmed up and stabilized and microbes have become, you know, acclimatized to that and active. And, um, are minimizing um, soil nutrients and, and things are starting to happen. And you can find, you know, even it's, I think it's fun <laughs> if you want to calculate it yourself. There is uh, WSU's Egg WeatherNet is a great resource if you go on there under summary reports, growing degree days, base temp 32. Uh, you can you can just track it. They, there's a weather station in Puyallup that will give you this number as we go through the season, so you don't have to calculate it. So the cautions are: doesn't mean you should spread nutrients or be driving equipment on saturated soil, which we will typically have around this time of year. So um, it can be hard to to really take advantage of that rate when we hit T sum 200, but. Uh, and then it's best on well-producing fields that can be grazed early in the season. Otherwise, you're going to apply a whole bunch of nutrients. You're going to grow a lot of grass, and that's going to overmature, and you're going to waste everything that you just did. So, um, and then you you don't need to apply. You never really need to apply your whole season's worth of nitrogen at once, but you definitely only want to do a small quarter to half of your nutrient needs to accommodate that spring growth as it's coming on. Yeah, when you start counting from, yeah, yeah. 
I'm gonna take some water. Excuse me. Okay, enough about that. So first for feeding your forage, first you gotta know what you have in the bank, so to speak, what do you have? Um, soil nutrient wise. So you gotta sample your soil. Now, why are you gonna do that? Mainly to establish your baseline nutrient status, quote unquote, um, just figuring out where you're at right now. And that may take a couple soil samples to really establish that trend. Um, the results are gonna vary um, a little bit each time. And so it really takes two or three times to, to start to get a good sense of what you have out in the soil. Uh, helps you determine application rates on nutrients you may need. Um, assess pH and your need for liming and then um, as one of those monitoring tools you can use going forward if it's part of your plan. And a funny uh, cartoon. So, soil sampling, how do you go about doing it? Uh, well, each sample should represent no more than 20 acres. Um, each single sample, so each bag that you send to the lab should be made up of 20 to uh, 15 to 20 ideally sub uh, subsamples of that less than 20 acre um, area. So you go run around, find your favorite spots in the pasture uh, randomly uh, 15 or 20 times, put it in a bucket, mix it up, and then take about two cups out of that bucket to make your one sample. I hope that's clear. Sample depth should be six, eight, or 12 inches deep. There's kind of some variance depending on the guidance that you look at. Recommend 12 inches deep um, and, and sticking to whatever you choose. If you choose six inches, stick with six inches. If you change, that's gonna change the reported amount of nutrients. 12 inches, um, I like in particular, uh, depth of a shovel more or less and um, it, fall nitrate tests, are, which we'll talk about in a second, are based on one foot samples. And then submit, you know, with enough lead time basically before you don't expect to take the sample, send it, and fertilize the next day. Give yourself enough time for the lab to process, which will usually take about two weeks. I can send these out too if you want. Yeah. <laughs> or you can call us. <laughs> so uh, we're happy to come out and take samples. Um, and historically, we've had a uh, first one's free soil sampling program. So if you've never sampled through us before, we can come out and take a sample. Send it off to the lab, um, standard sample. Now we do up to five uh, standard soil samples for folks. So if you want to take advantage of that, uh, reach out to any one of our farm team. Good question. Standard sample is organic matter, um, phosphorus, potassium, um, magnesium, calcium, pH, nitrate, and uh, sulfur. And cation exchange capacity but that doesn't really matter. I mean, it does matter, but you're not going to change it. So, um, just another way to look at the how to take a soil sample so you can see in the composite sampling approach if you had a situation like that picture there on the left where you, you have these very visibly different areas um, you would kind of break them up and, and sample each of those individually um, I had a much more in-depth slide that I decided to cut down on this that you could go further depending on you know your soil type in each one of those fields maybe it bisects a field and you want to sample each one of those halves differently or um, into separate samples. And then a graphic on just what we talked about before, less than 20 acres, um, you know, kind of walk around in a, in a random zigzag pattern, avoid areas where nutrients may concentrate or where uh, they may be devoid just, uh, you know, out of, out of the norm areas so that you're not skewing the results. So an example, um, you know, we have uh, a hand probe and an auger, and I like a shovel, uh, uh, solid steel shovel, um, and you can, you can sample with any one of them. You don't need special, special equipment. Um, if you sample with the shovel, you, you want to take kind of a, a core of that slice that you've taken. Um, 
so that you're getting the whole profile that you sampled um, and then mixing it all together again. Um, so do you have a question? Are you talking from, from the surface down to six inches or eight inches or 12 inches? Yeah. Include some of that whole core? Yes. Yeah. So you would go down to whatever your depth is going to be. And then there's, uh, you know, the sod, if, depending on what you have up top, you want to take off the highly organic matter portion right off the top and any grass or whatever that gets in, try and keep those pieces out. When do you want to sample? Uh, I would, for pastures, would mostly recommend fall. Um, and that's for a couple reasons. One, because um, not unlike crop scenarios where there's very specific, you know, you're going to plant in the spring and um, you want to know what your crop, your nutrient status is before you plant. You can pick a time of the year um, that's going to give you a sense of your nutrients and then just sample at that time of year every year. Um, and they shouldn't change too much year on year as far as um, variability just due to weather. So, um, and the other piece is it informs liming rates and is, um, it plays into your report card nitrate tests, again, which we'll talk about in a second. Just basically tells you how well you did on new, um, nitrogen management in the season before, which isn't a whole lot of help for that last season, but it can inform the decisions you make for next season. Spring, you, you can do, um, and it depends, you know, maybe if you're going to renovate, you could do in spring, um, more in-season nutrient needs. You're going to miss out um, on the timeliness of that information around liming time, which is in the fall, and uh, the report card nitrogen test. And then uh, you should sample every three years, every fall, ideally, for nitrate. Um, more frequently, if you are just starting to sample or if you are, well, mostly if you're just starting to sample, because it's going to take a while for you to figure out what, <clears throat> what the numerous tests that you've taken, how they kind of balance out, because some will be a little bit higher, some will be a little bit lower, and you won't really know until you've uh, taken a few of them. And if you wait three years between each one of them, you could be waiting a decade <laughs> before you kind of figure out what that trend is. And can't really act on it very quickly. So more frequently, more old story, and then you should do it. Uh, before you seed or renovate. Um, and I had some questions actually on this. Um, I wanted to see, make sure I didn't miss here. I think I have hit those ones so far. Oh, there was, there was a question about, are there any nutrients that are commonly lacking in pasture in the greater, greater Puyallup area? Um, we have a lot of phosphorus in a lot of places, um, mostly due to historic dairy in, in this area. Um, pH on the west side of the mountains tends to be low because of the amount of rain that we get, so lime um, is something you have to consider pretty regularly. Um, nitrate to the nitrogen that's going to feed your grass is going to get flushed out by all that rain too every season, and so you have to address that. Um, those are kind of the main ones. And then potassium and magnesium and sulfur. Magnesium, or um, rather sulfur, is also can get leached out. And so that's something you have to address periodically. Potassium, magnesium, and calcium tend to be just depends on the situation, I guess. Uh, taking the sample, you begged it up, you're ready to send it off, or we have done it for you. Um, bunch of labs that you can go to, kind of like the soil sampling depth. It's best to pick one and stick to it because they'll all be just a little bit different. And if you send one to one lab and one to another lab, they're not going to give you the same results. So um, that's fine because they tend to be internally consistent. And so if you stick with them, unless you have any reason not to, you should be able to judge you know, year to year uh, what changes are going on. And then we use ANL West Laboratories out of Portland and Modesto. But like I say, there's a bunch of other labs that you can you can go through. <laughs> Taking Rob, a one question. Yeah. It, um, do you plant a cover crop every winter to help with nitrogen levels? 
if you plant a cover crop. Um, there are more people who are incorporating kind of annual fodder crops. I, I would maybe call them more than, than cover crops in that situation. Um, you can do. Um, you could also interseed clover. We're actually working on a pasture innovation trial right now with WSU that's looking at the best ways to get um, clovers and other grasses established in existing pasture. Um, so yes, you, you could do that. As far as every year, I don't think for most folks that's going to be, that might be a lot of management for, for the benefit. I think it just depends on what your goal is. Again, if your goal is to have a source of um, high protein feed at a time that you wouldn't normally get it from grass, that can be really good. Um, if it's just because you heard it was a good, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, that sounds a little bit dismissive, but just if you, you think it sounds like a good idea, um, know why you're doing it, I guess is how I would, I would frame that. Um, all right, soil test interpretation. So you've taken the sample, you've sent it off to the lab, they've given it back to you or back to us. And if so, you won't have to worry about any of this. Well, sorry, we'll, we'll try and work with you so you understand it as we're going through the process. But if you haven't done it through us, you'd wanna know what to do next. So the interpretation portion is, okay, what elements am I gonna need? What soil nutrients do I need? How much of it do I need? What, what am I gonna get it from? What type of fertilizer? Um, what type of application? When to apply it? Uh, and will I get a return on my investment? This is commonly called the four R's of nutrient management, which is a little bit of a cop out because right each time it's not <laughs> actually the, uh, the, the actionable component of that. So right source, right rate, right time, right place. Okay. So we are going to walk through um, at a blisteringly high speed <laughs> soil sample. Both because I'm running short of time a little bit and because um, it's just um, the, the example that I have. But that being said, um, uh, my colleague Ali Nichols, who is our crop specialist here at the district, is going to be hosting a workshop with Andy Berry from WSU um, on uh, specifically focusing on organic nutrient sources. There's a little bit more management that goes on with organic nutrient sources, um, and that's coming up on March 5th. So um, register for her class if this gets you interested, but didn't answer all your questions, um, so you can go through that. I will at least try to give you a start on, on where you would do, and then we could work together if you have more questions. Okay, so from ANL Lab, this is what the test results look like. They look different depending on the lab you get them back from. Basically a table that lists out those nutrients that we talked about before. So this is the standard sample. This is the report you get back from it. And you can see you've got <laughs> organic matter. You've got um, two different rings of phosphorus, typically on the west side. We use P1, weak bray, um, and then the rest of your nutrients. So you've got this report back. And then you can go to a publication. Um, the one for our neck of the woods is Nutrient Management for Pastures in Western Oregon, Western Washington. It is also over on the table and I can send it out to folks. Um, but it will give you uh, a sense of what, what ranges you should be aiming for um, for each of those nutrients. So for phosphorus, we're looking around 30. Um, potassium, we're looking around 200. Uh, magnesium over 100, calcium over 100. These are all kind of sufficiency bases. And then pH 5, 8 to 7, depending on the crop that you're growing. Legumes to clovers are going to respond. They're going to not like as acidic conditions as grass is going to be able to tolerate. So if you want more clovers in your pasture, pH is definitely something that you're going to want to pay attention to. And then uh, nitrogen and sulfur, nitrogen, like I said, in the fall is the time to do it. <clears throat> around the time this sample was taken, you can see um, it's around the end of September, and that's, that's the time it's gonna give you the best information. Otherwise, it doesn't, it's not actually really that helpful. 
Um, but at this time of year, if you get a sample, it should be between 10 and uh, 30 parts per million. Too much, you ap apply too much nutrient and wasted money um, and have a potential water quality concern if you continue to do that for a long period of time. And then um, too little, obviously, you could have probably gotten more from your grass if it would have had more nitrogen data. Sulfur, somewhat similar, um, 10 to 20. So from that, we can see we've got, you know, our soil organic matter is high, but pretty typical actually for this particular soil type. pH is very high. Uh, potassium is moderate. Magnesium is a little bit low, um, right on the edge. Calcium's moderate. pH is low. Um, nitrate is low. Sulfur is low. And so once we know that, we can refer to the guidance that the land grant university have, you know, spent years researching. Uh, and these are tables from this publication that's um, on the table over there to give you a sense of, okay, we are, we have um, less than a hundred parts per million phosphorus, um, what, or uh, rather uh, potassium, what should we be applying? And it'll give you um, the range that you should apply within. So that's kind of the basic component of it. And then same for same for uh, lime applications depending on uh, the level your lime's at now and the soil buffer index. You get two numbers for pH. The buffer uh, is basically how how responsive is it going to be to lime application. You can look to this and and we're at 6-1 here. Um, 6-1 into an established field, we're looking at a top dress of about two tons of lime per acre. Any questions on this piece as we go through? Question. Sure. Specific to lime. Mm -hmm. You get the powdered lime and you get the lime sand. Mm -hmm. Different. Different. Sand on and, and got a love note from uh, the well, <coughs> the water quality people. Hmm. The really? Uh -huh. I got my dirt. Nitrates went way up. Interesting. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. that? Nitrate. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. the question here was between different uh, lime sources, um, whether you're using a powder or more of a granular, um, coarser material. Lime sand. And did you did you have an analysis like a, yeah. is there a yeah nothing yeah um, he uh, this gentleman was having a particular issue uh, where there was some thought that it might be affecting his nitrate numbers that would be very very unlikely um, so typically the difference between the materials is a finer uh, ground it's actually scored so their calcium carbonate equivalent. Um, or um, sieve score uh, is going to indicate how reactive it's going to be, how quickly it's going to react in the soil. And so finer is going to react uh, more quickly. It's not going to have quite as long a, of an effect as a coarser material. There's also pelleted lime, which is just easier to handle um, as well. Uh, so that plays into it as well. Okay. Um, so we've run through, um, we've, you know, kind of figure out where our nutrients are, are at in uh, relationship to the, the levels that they should be, uh, consulted the land grant university for, um, recommendations on, um, levels, uh, that are elements that we need to get back up and, um, and we've come to this conclusion of we need 120 pounds per acre uh, potassium, two tons of lime, uh, 75 pounds of uh, nitrogen, which we'll talk about in a second, and uh, about 12 pounds of sulfate. Oh, and this is just showing you the nitrate report card. More math. Um, so I will try and do this justice. So we know that we need 
120 pounds per acre of phosphorus. That's what they're of potassium. Um, that's what the Langerhans University guidance has shown us. And we have this fertilizer material, which is myriad of potash, double uh, double zero sixty. And we want to figure out how much of that material do we need to supply that 120 pounds of potassium. Formula for that, very simple. One of the formulas you could use is the pounds recommended or the pounds that you need divided by the amount of uh, nutrient in the fertilizer material times 100. That's because the number on the bag is a percentage of um, how much is in there. So if you have a 100 pound bag, 60 pounds of that is potassium or K2O, K2O in this uh, situation. So you can see the, the run through there on the bottom of the kind of mock-up fertilizer label. We needed 120. We divided it by 60, the amount uh, in, in this particular fertilizer material. Uh, which came out to two times 100, that's 200 pounds per acre of potassium. Does that make sense? I mean, that's pretty straightforward math as far as, um, yeah, what you need. I'm going to skip calcium because we are running a little bit long. Um, we didn't need it anyway, so that was just a bonus. Um, our folks are right if we run a little bit long. If you have to leave, I'm not going to be offended, but I will try and not rush too much. Gets a little bit more complicated when we're talking about multiple different amendments. So um, in, we figured out from the uh, nutrient, uh, the uh, nitrogen guidance in that nutrient management in Western Oregon, Washington, that we need about 75 pounds per acre based on the amount of production that we have. That incorporates kind of organic matters, contribution, um, that's hard to calculate depending on your situation. So they've, they've got you close to the ballpark there. So we need 75 uh, pounds per acre of N of nitrogen. Urea has uh, uh, 46 pounds uh, in this 100 pound bag, let's say. So 75 divided by 46, 1.63, about 163 pounds. But we also needed sulfur. And the way we're going to apply sulfur, it doesn't have to be the way we're going to apply sulfur, but in this instance, we're going to use ammonium sulfate because it's easy to get and relatively cheap. Um, so the complication there is if we apply ammonium sulfate, we've already reached all of our nitrogen amount from the urea, and now we're going to apply another you know, 50, 50 pounds from the, from the ammonium sulfate. So we'd be over-applying. That's a waste of money and a potential oil concern. So um, instead, I'd you know, recommend starting with that um, ammonium sulfate or kind of the, the lower need, um, lower amount um, fertilizer that you're going to apply and play around with these numbers. And again, we can work together uh, when you run into to questions. But in this case, we're going to balance, we're going to apply based on the amount of sulfur that we need. So we needed 12 pounds of sulfur. This has 24 pounds per 100 pounds. Uh, that gets us to 50 pounds per acre of this uh, ammonium sulfate. That 50 pounds is gonna give us about 10.5 pounds of nitrogen. So we gotta go back, subtract that from the amount we needed, which was 75 pounds of nitrogen. That now becomes 64.5 pounds, divided by the same 46 um, pounds in uh, the bag of urea to get a total of 140. And that, that combination will reach both our um, sulfur needs and our nitrogen needs uh, throughout the season. Don't put these on all at once, all at the same time. Uh, the idea would be, you know how much you need in total, and then you can start to parcel it out um, throughout the year. So, um, you know, some in, the, in early spring to accommodate spring growth, some in the later spring to keep it growing, excuse me, and then just a little bit in the fall to accommodate um, fall uh, regrowth when kind of the rain returns. 
and then we're, we're coming back to the Western Oregon and Washington pastor calendar. They have one of their appendix has kind of a, a schedule of when particular nutrients would typically be applied. So, um, so that's, you, you would plan it out like that. Mow to grow. Okay. We're getting to the last two pieces and these are pretty short, so we'll be pretty close to on time. So nutrients, water, light, temperature will only get you so far. If the grass says it's time to stop growing, it's going to stop growing. Um, so the solution is try not to give the grass the last say in it. Very, very brief primer on grass physiology. There's really three main phases that grass grows through, goes through, well, I guess grows through um, as it's uh, growing, and that's vegetative elongation and reproduction. So the vegetation is really setting the power plant up for the grass plant, um, getting as much leaf mass on as it can. Elongation is those reproductive stems starting to um, lengthen out um, to support the uh, seed head that they're gonna produce. Uh, and then reproduction, of course, the, the production of seeds. Um, and the grass is trying to get to that point. That's the end of its life, right? It wants to make seed and um, you know grow more grass later on. The problem with that is kind of twofold. One is you can see by this graph down here in the corner that as it is um, growing through those phases, the amount, the yield, the actual physical amount of plant that's out there is going up, but at some point the yield of that uh, amount is going down uh, because of change in nutrients in the grass itself, um, complex carbohydrates, stuff that is harder to digest for, for animals. Um, so there's this kind of ideal point between the amount of yield that you're going to get and the amount of quality that it has that you want to you want to shoot for um and so you're you may be getting lots of grass but it's not you know totally digestible and then the other piece is um, regrowth after reproduction is reduced mostly because it's kind of you know achieved its life goals and those reproductive uh, uh stems are, are gone and so it'll grow back from another spot on that bunch plant but um, it's going to be a reduced rate of growth so if you can keep it within that as you can see here it says boot and stem elongation and vegetative phase you're um, kind of in the sweet spot but really mowing everybody hates mowing you know everybody hates mowing their one but it is uh, a really really good tool uh, for a couple of reasons the first is like we talked about that digestibility piece, that um, palatability piece. If you're, um, especially if you are in a selective grazing environment, horses are uh, notorious for this, where they will graze down areas to the dirt and then there'll be nice patches of really nice green grass out there that's over matured. Um, and so this can help even those areas out. Um, and if you combine that with not giving them the choice to, to selectively graze like that, you can avoid those situations and keep, uh, keep as much palatability as you can. And then it also maintains that vegetative grass growth as long as possible. So like you were saying, um, as it gets ahead of you in the spring, because that regrowth or that, yeah, that regrowth period is that much shorter, um, if you let it go, too long, it's going to get to that reproduction phase. Quality is going to drop. So you want to get out if you can, if the soil is not super wet, and and uh, mow it back and keep it vegetatively growing as much as you can. And then the last thing is it um, helps control weeds as well. Um, it depends. You know, it's a supplemental technique to other things you may have, especially uh, other techniques you may use, especially if you have really problem weeds. Um, but well fertilized, well managed grass is is a really good competitor to most weeds. So, um, so when to mow? Uh, mowing for uniformity. So this is evening out those roughs and greens, those overgrazed versus undergrazed areas. Ideally, after east rotation, um, and you could do it less frequency. Again, it's more or some is better than none. 
but ideally it would be after each rotation to just kind of even everything out. Um, and you'd want to mow it down to whatever your stubble height is that you're choosing to graze to. So that might be six inches if you're grazing to 12 um, or no less than three to four inches. Mowing is for weed control, kind of depends on, on what you're trying to control. More perennial weeds, you know, you're hoping to sap their energy reserves over time by reducing the amount of uh, biomass or the amount of ability they have to capture light and make energy. Um, and you can also, for less perennial weeds, take out the seed head before it develops and matures. So it can't spread more, at least. And again, that's similar. Mow down to whatever your chosen stubble height is, or at least no less than three to four inches. And then mowing for vegetative growth to sort of avoid that flush of green grass going to waste um, and getting over mature. You want to mow it anytime it's getting into the, the boot stage. You could probably let it go a little bit longer, but um, boot stage is a good indicator. And that's when the seed head is starting to push out of the leaf sheath. Um, so as you're walking through the field, you can start to see that happen. Um, and then it depends on the height that you want to mow to, depends on when you're able to, to get out there. If you're not going to be able to get out there for a while, you know, it might not, depend, might not matter what your stubble height is. You might want to mow it down to that three inches so it's got longer to grow before you know you can get back out there. Is that the half, the half, the half, the half the Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the grass, okay, so this is the last piece. Um, summer slump is basically that cliff at the end of August and September when it's really dry around here. Hey, Robin. Yes. Can I ask two questions about the previous part really sure. quickly? Yeah. Um, one is if you drag a pasture after grazing on a somewhat regular basis, would you still spread compost of manure on it in the spring and or fall? Depending on what your soil sample says and what your compost analysis says. Okay. So not as a matter of course. I wouldn't say just go out there and spread compost every year. Um, kind of regardless, I would say take a soil sample, um, see if you're, how much you're supplying through the feed that you're bringing on and it's passing through the animals um, and then decide if you need to if anything the compost is going to give you is going to help your pasture okay and then the next question is is there a growth chart that we can use per stages of grass such as keeping grass in the main growing stage are there growth charts so like to see what it looks like throughout each stage so you can kind of, I, I guess I would need a little bit more clarification on what the person is asking there. There are, um, I think Renee had something. Else. No, okay. Um, I mean, that there's very simple, like I think the boot is probably one of the key indicators that you really need to know because that's really indicating that, that jump from stem elongation to the reproductive phase. That's, that's the piece that I would pay the most attention to. There are, and like for cereal grains, it's it's a big um, deal to know what particular phase of vegetation it's in, because there might be five of them. I don't know them off the top of my head, but um, that's less so, at least that I've found. Um, yeah. 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 Renee's making a good point that, um, you know, it, it may be difficult, you know, to maybe harder to know based on the different species because they're going to look different at the same stage of maturity. Um, and I don't know of any chart that'll show you, you know, lined up. Well, no, I could look. <laughs> Do you know of any, Renee? Yeah. Okay. 
that would be another one um, if that folks uh, if that person wants to reach out to Renee or myself or would be happy to follow up on that question. Great, I'll let know. <laughs> okay. Um, last one. All right. So just some cool graphs that show you what the grass growth uh, looks like over the course of a season and that you can see very dramatically where it drops off. Um, we will skip through most of this. Uh, this is going back to the pasture calendar, just describing what's happening at that time of year. Um, and I think really the key piece here is to look at those dates on the bottom and you can see there's a wide variability between up in the foothills, down to prairie soils, you know, when this dormancy is going to occur. Um, and again, if you're new to an area or you've got different, um, you know, soil moisture, soil water holding capacity soils on your, on your property, this may be good for you to consider. So um, the, the key, one of the key reasons for this is uh, due to soil temperature, moisture plays a role, but temperature also really uh, plays into this. So between 42 and 52 degrees, uh, grass is, is growing, but not super strongly. 52 to 62, it's growing really well. And then above 62, it starts to really shut down. Um, part of that, again, moisture, part of that um, microorganisms not tolerating the temperature very well and roots not being able to do what they need to do. So um, really that six, above 62 degree soil temperature, or average air temperature for a week, um, which are basically the same, will is, is a key indicator to when that summer slump is gonna come on. So in other words, time between 42 degrees and 60 degrees equals the time that the pasture is growing equals where you want to be. That's a wine thermometer that just happens to have those <laughs> temperatures mapped out on it. So you need, uh, need help figuring out what your soil temperatures are. So we've, we've kind of talked about, you can manage your plant growth uh, based on, uh, you know, the plant development managed by mowing or grazing, soil fertility you can test for and then fertilize to amend, soil moisture uh, you can address by irrigation, soil temperature, how do we do that? Well, by keeping at least three inches of snow, <laughs> this is a trick, um, a trick slide, I guess. But really, it is the more biomass that you can leave on top of the um, soil, the better insulated it's going to be. And so it's it's able to buffer out the swings in temperature much better than if it's this tall, right? Because there's there's nothing there that's um, maintaining that temperature. Um, and so that, that also comes back to that four to six inch um, uh, suggestion on the rapid growth periods. You wanna keep a little bit more as you're coming into this period so that you can uh, maintain that insulation for as long as possible and keep it growing just as long as you can before it, it will eventually, you know, depending on where you're at, most likely go dormant. So, um, you know, it's, it's also setting a solid foundation for next year. Uh, keeping the soil covered is going to keep you cooler and moisture in the summer, keep the plants growing longer. That's what we just talked about. It's also going to keep the soils warmer in winter and keep the plants growing longer in the fall. And then the plants are going to start growing sooner in spring because the soil is um, going to be warmer to start with. That's it. So the, we've, we've covered all those bases. I'm not even going <laughs> to read back through them. Uh, if there's any last questions, I just wanted to leave this uh, quote here that I found from a guy who works at NRCS um, that says, plant only fence post for the first three years after changing grazing. A lot of times people want to go out and uh, renovate their pastures or make really extreme changes without realizing that it's going to take time for those management changes that you make to really show themselves in the pasture. Because it took a, a while for it to get to that condition. It's going to take as much or more time. To get that. That's it. Yeah. 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 Um, AWHC, we'll just go back to that, is available water holding capacity. So that's basically showing the difference between a soil that's able to hold on to moisture really well and a soil that's not able to hold on to moisture. And that's just...
other questions? I'm sorry, I went over by <laughs> 15 minutes, but any questions on the call, Glenn? Um, not specific ones, just requests for the handouts, worksheets and Excel templates I to be sent out. And actually the slides. Yeah, yeah, I can send that. Is that possible? Yep. Yeah, okay. Cool. And then um, and then I'm recording this, so with okay. luck it will work and um, and you can have the recording of it to post on your website if you want to do that. Awesome. Cool. Well, I guess if nobody else has any questions, that's it. Gwen, thank you so much for, for moderating on, on your side. And thank you to everybody who was out there on the call. Uh, and I hope to meet up with you folks or you contact Renee or Paul at some point. And thank you guys for being here. Appreciate it.